Well, I think what we're all looking for in our spiritual journey is a vibrant spiritual life. One that is full of all kinds of divine flow, of the goodness of God flowing in and through and around and ever for us. Of the wonderful sense of peace and joy, of love, of wonderful harmony, contentment, all flowing in and through our lives. We love to be in divine flow. That flow that comes in, flows through us, flows out from us, and re-flows in once again. Outside of my office on the second floor, you'll find a fountain that's been running 24 hours. It goes recycling this wonderful flow of water, flows down from one pitcher to another pitcher to another pitcher, finally into the receptacle and recycles again. It's a constant reminder that we are in divine flow. No matter what our experience may be today, know that you're in the midst of flow, and flow may bring something even greater, better for you, or the unfolding of good. When we're in that divine flow, we know that that which is our perfect desire of peace and joy is is welcomed into our lives as we rest in that wonderful place of the divine flow of all good within us. So what do we do to really help create and stimulate and maintain this wonderful flow? If there was only one personal attribute we would need, There's only one that would make this possible. I could say and emphasize this one key word, this one key element that's so crucial for our lives. It's important. It's that we have commitment. Commitment changes everything when it comes around divine flow. For it enables that divine flow to be sustained and consistent when we are committed to it. When we're committed to all the spiritual practice and all the wonderful works that we do within our hearts and our lives, when we do it consistently in the realm of a strong and powerful commitment, we maintain this wonderful divine flow. I'm so grateful that the outlet is committed to providing energy to the fountain, which enables that fountain to constantly flow. And so I appreciate that great commitment that's there. For that commitment keeps that wonderful message going to me. Every time I come to my office door, I remember I'm in divine flow. But what's crucial for that flow to maintain and to be sustained within our lives is a level of commitment. Commitment being dedication, devotion, allegiance, faithfulness, attentiveness. And this time of year is the great season of commitment failure. Mm-hmm. That's right. How many of you made these wonderful New Year's resolutions? Uh huh. Yes, we all begin the year with a new commitment to diet, exercise, the new you, the wellness, health and vitality, eating right. We think about all these wonderful things and we say, this is my year. I'm going to quit smoking. I'll drink less. Maybe not drink less, but I'll stop drinking some. And you all go on. We make these bargains with ourselves, don't we? And this is the season of commitment failure. Good intentions, sometimes slipping away. When asked, what exactly is a New Year's resolution? Well, it's a to-do list that lasts for about two weeks. And that really sums it up. Because it's full of all kinds of great intentions for our lives. But sometimes the focus is lost in that journey. And it drifts away like an untethered boat that hasn't been tied to the dock. It wants to slip away with every little wave and current from our lives because what's lacking for us is a level of commitment to it. Now, commitment wanes so often when we lose sight of the goal. We keep forgetting. Oh, yes, I wanted to lose weight because I wanted to get ready for that bikini season. Uh Uh-huh. And uh, you're thinking all about that when you're going to slide into this wonderful summer attire or you're thinking about and you lose sight of the goal when those donuts are being passed at the office. And you lose sight of the goal when there's this opportunity for desserts at a party or you lose sight of the goal. And you know what it's like when we have lost sight of the goal in our lives and it slips away from us. There goes our level of commitment. So it is when it comes to our spiritual life, we have to ask ourselves, what's the goal? What's the goal that we really want? What is it we're trying to achieve? Now, Jesus said, follow me. Did you ever stop to ask, wait a minute, where is he going? Where do we follow you? Where? Where do you want to go? What are you saying, Jesus? When you say, follow me, 
Many people say, oh, I can't wait to go to Israel. I want to walk on the steps and I want to walk on the stones and the roads where Jesus walked. I want to follow him in these footsteps. I had the opportunity of going to Israel years ago and have the opportunity to walk on these roads and say, Jesus walked here. These stones were here. It's wonderful to think about following, but wait a minute, where was he going? You see, it wasn't about an earthly destination. For the goal there, we get confused and we think, well, of course it's not an earthly destination. It's follow him to heaven. But Jesus intended for us to experience something here, now. I might illustrate as best that the goal of our spiritual life is found in this. Picture the bicycle wheel with all its many spokes. And it's radiating out from a central hub. You know, that wheel, the little hub in the middle, all those spokes going outward. You know how those spokes, as they come from the rim and head towards the center, they get closer and closer together, don't they? That center hub is what sustains and holds everything together. And that describes our spiritual life, where that central hub is God. Jesus is saying, follow me into this wonderful place where you are so centered, where you have now encountered, where you've experienced God to the fullest. And so it is that each one of those spokes, as we draw closer to the hub, we find that we are even more connected in the sense of oneness, one with one another, that we can sing, I love myself so much. But, you know, and that we move on from that, that you can love me so much. And we move on to that understanding, this wonderful sense of connectedness and love that happens within our lives. Jesus is saying, follow me to come to this center, come to this place of awareness of God here, now, in this moment. It's not so much when you die. That's not the purpose. For your life here every day has a purpose for living. And that purpose is to encounter this divine, to come to this hub, to come to this center, to find this wonderful sense of oneness with God and to find this wonderful place deep within. So how is it we keep this focus then that will enable us to get to the center? If commitment is crucial for our spiritual growth and it is the continual experience then of divine flow that commitment operates and facilitates, well, tell me then, tell me. Uh, how do I keep my commitment? I'm so glad you asked. I'm so glad you asked, because here's it is. Scripture is unfolding for you very simply this. The text you read today from Isaiah 26, verse 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. Keep, sustain. Because in the midst of commitment, there's perfect peace. When we're committed to something, we find the peace. When we're not committed and there's this wavering state, that's not a peace about whatever we're trying to achieve within our lives. That will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on God, stayed, centered, who's come down to the hub, who's reached, attained that, that center space, that has followed Jesus in a pathway that's brought them to this realization of the divine within their own lives. They have this personal experience that's so dynamic. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because in that state, it's easy to trust. That's this beautiful passage that is this guiding force for us to help us to understand. How do I keep this commitment that would sustain a day-to-day -day experience of divine flow happening within my life of the blessings, of the goodness, of the wonderful peace and joy, all that is of God that is intended for me? Well, it's key that we understand this passage that says he'll keep him, that the Spirit of God will keep us and that that power is at work within us at all times when we have our mind committed or held to, committed to, or stayed on. That simply means that we've set the direction of our thoughts. We've set the direction of our mind. Years ago, I had the opportunity to go on a sailing yacht, uh, sailing around Antigua, going from island to island in the Caribbean. It was this wonderful 175-foot yacht with a crew of five. We were sailing, and the, the crew would set the sails and pull up from the port and uh, go across the ocean going uh, in, with the intention of moving from island to island. 
And oh, I thought how wonderful it is just to relax and rest on this beautiful yacht and I'm going to enjoy my week and I brought my books and I'm laying out on the deck and there I am reading and drifting off to sleep and all of a sudden there's this huge commotion going on. And I, what's going on? And everyone says, duck, lay down because we're changing direction. We're setting sails in a new direction for a new course. What an experience it was to see everybody working, pulling on the ropes, the sails unfolding and going in new direction, the wind blowing through them and then capturing the energy and force of the wind and moving this yacht in a new direction. This is what we do in our spiritual life. We set sail constantly, every single day. This is setting that intention in our desire life, for the desires of our life. When our mind is committed, what we're doing is saying, I'm so committed that no matter what the experience I'm going through right now, it may require resetting the sails, that we go in another direction. It may require that we are there staffing these sails and making sure that the wind is, the force is there to drive us in the direction that we want to go. How important it is that we understand that our mind then be committed and committed by setting these intentions that every day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. Every day and every way, God is working in and through me. Every day and in every way, we embrace this thought and this consciousness that the Spirit of God is moving. That's living in expectancy. That's our theme for this year. That's the whole idea that every day we've set the sails and we're setting a course for expecting something amazing to unfold within our lives. Next thing that's really important that we find in this passage is that we remove all distractions. Because if our mind is going to be stayed on God, we have to make sure that those distractions, those little thoughts that come through are released and let go and dismissed. The greatest challenge to our spiritual life is when we start entertaining these chaotic thoughts of mind chatter, the monkey chatter going on in our head, those kind of thoughts that want to create uh, obstacles to our belief and our hope and our trust for the highest and best that want to stir up doubt within us. We need to find ways to remove all those distractions because we know how it is in our life. Shiny things really attract us and pull us away at any moment, don't they? Ooh, wait, 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 wait. And there we go. And we're distracted and we've lost our focus on our spiritual development and our spiritual growth within our hearts and our lives. Beautiful passage that illustrates us in the Bible. And again, every Bible story is our story. So here's our story. You are this. Elijah. And Elijah was overseeing the children of Israel and he experiences this setback in his ministry, shall we say. Jezebel is in power and this queen allows the worship of Baal. But Elijah destroys the idols and tries to bring an end to this kind of worship that's going on. And the angry queen Jezebel seeks to destroy Elijah and he runs off fleeing for his life. He's scared. He goes off into the wilderness. That word wilderness then to us really symbolic for going off into the woe is me moment or the confusion or the depression or the sadness. And yes, even that victimness that we sometimes want to go to. You see, little experiences like this, when you're moving in a great direction, you feel like you're doing something dynamic for God. And then someone says, well, wait a minute, I'm going to make your life miserable or I'm going to, um, I'm going to uh, speak against you or in some way I'm going to not believe you or trust you, and all these emotions go in, and we welcome ourselves to this experience where we're like, what am I doing with my spiritual life? Am I going anywhere? Is this really, oh, woe is me, and I'm just a victim to the world around me. And we get distracted. You see, Elijah got distracted by these experiences around him, and yet he was the prophet he was the one supposedly bringing the light to the world, and suddenly he allowed this distraction to diminish that light. And he begins to say, take my life. Oh, drama queen. We love this because it's so drama. You know what I mean? I can just see all the, oh, take my life. You know, I want to die. I've done all this, and now no one appreciates me. No one loves me. Yeah. Did I say this is our story? Yeah. Your story too? Uh-huh. We've all been there. We've all had this moment. Something happens, it distracts us to the point where we are now, oh, you don't, you don't know how difficult it is. You don't know how painful this experience is. You know how it's so, woe is me. Oh, you know, why, Lord, why me? And we sing these all songs over and over again in our lives, thinking of all this 
you don't know the trouble I've seen, you know, and uh, we go on with this within our lives. And so Elijah sits under this tree and an angel comes to feed him and offers this advice and says, get up and go to the mountain. Get up and go to a higher place. Get up and move to a higher level. So he does. But what does he do? He goes to a cave and he's hiding out in this place of darkness. And again, the spirit of God speaks to him through this messenger and says, what are you doing in a cave? What are you doing in this place of darkness? What are you doing hiding out here? I said, move on up to a higher place. Well, you see, he was misunderstanding everything. And so he goes to stand out in the higher place thinking, oh, okay, I've now achieved this high elevation. Now I want to experience all the divine of God and I want to experience it all in my life. And so the wind began to blow. God wasn't in the wind. And the earth began to shake, but God wasn't in the shaking earth. And the fire began to burn, this scripture says, but God wasn't in the fire. Not in the wind, not in the earthquake, but not in the fire. Well, where is God? Where is this God? And then his still small voice, the voice of God was heard in the stillness, in the quiet, in the embodiment of be still and know. You see, we allow so many things to come as distractions in our life. When what sustains us, what keeps our mind stayed, what keeps us in this place where we don't allow distractions to carry us away, is the stillness. We don't find God in the earthquakes. We don't find God in the wind. We don't find God in the fire. And that just simply illustrates to us that we're looking for God in all kinds of things in all different kinds of places. Wait a minute, we've got to find God in this big cathedral, or we've got to find God in this holy sacred place, or we've got to move to this location or that location to find God somewhere. We're searching always in the outward. And it's just simply be still, because God's not going to be in the wind, not going to be in the fire or the earthquake, meaning it's symbolic of where you're looking, but right here when we look within. That's what keeps us in a mind that stayed on God when we go within in the midst of every storm and every challenge. Now, the key is staying in that presence because commitment is about staying. It's not about coming and going, coming and going. And somehow we think that that's what commitment is. Oh, I, you know, I try to explain that to my trainer at the gym. I'm committed, but sometimes I come, sometimes I don't. You know, he said, that's not commitment. You know, if you think you're going to try to make any accomplishments at the gym, it means you come every day or you come along the pattern you set that goal it's not coming and not coming coming and not going and all these kind of things that we may think that that's what commitment can be within our lives as we find in the passage of scripture from james chapter one the double-minded person is what it's talking about the person who's unable to make that commitment to one side or the other will result in nothing you know i want to but i don't want to uh, yes, I am, but I'm not going to be. You see, that kind of wavering in life never gets us. We think, oh, but I want to achieve something spiritually in my life. I want to grow to a new level. I want to have a new level of understanding, but I really don't want to do the work and invest in the energy. But I really want this, and I'm planning this, and, uh, but I'm sort of coming and going, and it's that wavering that we go through in our lives. We never seem to accomplish anything great within our life. You know? How many of you tried to learn a new language and you had a great passion for it? You bought the tapes, you buy the book, you go to the classes, you learn to speak Spanish 101, and you got hola down pat. Uh huh. You got, you know, guacamole down pat and a few other words, you know, cucaracha, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you think, wow, I'm now fluent. But then you realize, wait a minute, that's not learning the language because you're not committed to moving beyond. A few words does not make you fluent. You see, it's that commitment to walking all the way through, attending all the classes, to experience the fullness of what it's like to be bilingual, to be fluent within it. There's a story told of um, a great tenor in opera, Luciano Pavarotti, and he writes that when he was a boy, his father was a baker, and he introduced him to all these wonderful uh, experiences in music. And as a young boy, his father urged him to work hard to develop his voice. And he took voice lessons. 
Along with that, he desired to go off to college and maybe become a teacher. And as he began to work on his voice and work on his education, he became in this wonderful place where he said, Dad, what do I do? Should I be a teacher or should I be a singer? Where do I go? You see, I've got two choices in life. And the fathers replied to him simply this, you have two chairs. And if you try to sit on two chairs, you're going to fall between them. For life, in life, you must choose one chair. So choose. What chair will it be? And so he chose the music career. It foundered at first, didn't go very far. And of course, we know uh, he is one of the great uh, singers of opera in the world today. And his career took off because of a commitment to one chair. You see how important that is in our lives? We say, what is it we really want in our spiritual life? What do you want? Is it just... Uh, a little bit of peace, enough to just sustain me through? Or are you wanting to live the life Jesus called you to live? Abundant life, rich, full, full of prosperity and blessing, health, wholeness, and all the goodness that is intended for you. Because let me tell you this, I want to remind you over and over again, God didn't bring you here to suffer. You know? Somehow we think, oh, suffering saints is the holy world journey for our life. And we think somehow that, well, the more we suffer, that's God's intention for this world. I want to remind you over and over again that all the passages of Scripture talk about abundance, fullness, richness of life, the generosity of God, all these things, and they go over our head because we've got somehow an idea of our piety being found in how much sacrifice we make and how great our suffering is. And yet that's not God's intention. That's man's intention. So when we understand this, that the divine promise for us is available to us that we live in this realm of a successful life every single day of our journey. Success, success in everything that you do, success in every way. This wonderful experience of the divine love flowing in and through you in wonderful relationships and in encounters of harmony and peace with the world around you. This wonderful feeling of being health and walking in health and wholeness and healing being yours. All these things are available to us if we want them. And if we're committed to them, then divine flow happens. And it happens in us. And it flows through us in wonderful and powerful ways. It says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts, because the person trusts in God. You see, it's really a wonderful place to be when we trust in the Lord with all of our heart, because that trust is this demonstration of a commitment. When you trust something, when you trust it to be so, when you trust it to be true, there's a commitment to it that you rest in it. You know, the other day we were climbing up on the roof and uh, we opened up this big extension ladder to get up on the roof of our two story home to check on the eaves and some of the uh, pine straw that it collected in the little cracks and crevices on the roof line. Well, let me tell you, it took trust in that ladder to ascend. Uh huh. Every time I look down, and okay, we're going to go a little higher, and I look down, and okay, I keep trusting, I keep trusting, I keep trusting. And that trust was based on, I am committed to this ladder. This ladder better hold me. This ladder is going to keep me. This ladder is going to help me ascend. This ladder is not only going to take me up, but the ladder is going to help me get down. That's trust, and that's a true commitment in it. Because the thing about commitment is, it doesn't have an on or off switch, you know? Those things in your life that you're committed to, you know, they, it's not like pregnancy. You can't be kind of pregnancy. You're pregnant, you know. You either are or you aren't. You're committed, you either are or you're not. And that's where we have to come to real terms with our life to say, how committed are we to our spiritual growth and development? How committed are we to divine flow of blessing within our hearts and our lives? So in that commitment, it may take a moment when we are actually looking at the beliefs that we're committed to. You know, what are the beliefs that we're committed to? Because sometimes we have a commitment uh, to some things that we realize, well, wait a minute, I don't really believe them, and they're not really working for me. They're not really working. Sometimes we have these commitments that we need to check out and reevaluate, seek greater clarity about. And uh, having the opportunity to really evaluate them and say, what is it I really believe and how does it fit? And how is it working in my life? 
is when we think of God being so separated from us that God's somewhere up in the sky, you know, and then we want to say, well, there's not a spot where God is not. But wait a minute, you just said God's up in the sky. God's up in heaven. God's sitting on a throne. God is in one location. How can you say that God is everywhere? How can everyone, God be everywhere when God is in one spot? When we make God into a being and say God is this man, God is this uh, being in a physical body somewhere up in the heavens and the sky, then how does he become this wonderful presence that is felt everywhere? See, sometimes we have to look at our beliefs and say, if we're going to be committed to them, do they really work for us? Are they really there for us? If we believe that's in this concept that God is a punishing God and that if you fail in some way, God is going to send you off to hell, then we have to ask ourselves, what do we believe about grace? Do we believe grace is unmerited favor? You didn't earn it. It's just given to you. God says, I'm gracious. I give this to you. So the question is, does grace end? Is there a place where God says, okay, today I'm done with grace. Uh-uh. Wrap it up. No more grace for you. I'm sorry. Amy, you're done. We've done everything we can. We've been as gracious as we could. But now no more grace for Amy. I'm sorry. She's out. Okay. We all know that now. Okay. So, you know, but that's not God. God is unlimited grace. So then how can grace be unmerited favor given freely to us? And then we somehow believe that God's going to send us off to an eternal, eternal, forever and ever punishment of burning in damnation and hell. Ooh, how does that work for us? How do we balance this out? How do we connect the dots on that? We believe God's full of grace, but does grace end? Do we say, well, no, grace can't end. So then how is it that God says, well, you know, I'll be gracious to you while you're burning, you know, enjoy yourself, but just know that I'll be gracious to you, you know, spend that time in hell and those flames and gnashing of teeth. You see, then we have to ask us, what do we believe about this? How does it work in our mind? So then we understand what was being taught to us that Jesus brought about of his understanding of that that which is hell is that which we're creating in our own mind and happens through our lack of commitment. We create our own hell here now in this moment. And God's grace, yes, is with us through this journey of life, ever giving us unmerited favor. We have to ask ourselves, what is it you believe? And are those beliefs working for you? And do they make sense? Or have we just received them, given to us, departed by our religious backgrounds without us asking questions or searching them out or inquiring deeper? You know, I grew up in the Pentecostal church. My father was my pastor. I mean, you know, I'm every Sunday listening not only to my dad, but he's my minister. And he's telling me constantly all about this wonderful rapture that's coming, that's going to take away a select group and leave all the rest of the people behind to suffer in damnation. And oh, wow. So I began to believe this idea that Jesus was coming any moment, any moment right now. And as a kid, I was like, oh, have I failed? Have I sinned? Have I done something wrong? Because Jesus could come right here and now. And if my mom and dad hadn't returned home, what would I do? I had Mrs. Bridge on speed dial. Mrs. Bridge was the saint of the church. And if I wondered, is Jesus coming? Is Jesus coming? Has the rapture happened? My mom and dad are not here. I'm now scared. I've been left behind. And I would push the button on speed dial. She'd say hello. And I'd go, good. Okay. I'm good. Yeah. I'm still good here. Yeah. Right. No rapture just yet. Okay. I began to think, wait a minute. What kind of fear this imparted to my life that every day I was questioning, was I going to be left behind? And I read all these beautiful passages that I will never leave you nor forsake you. Wait a minute. My dad said I'm going to be left behind, that God's going to leave me. But this passage says the Spirit of God will never leave us nor forsake us. So I had to ask myself, what do I really believe? What do I really believe? And then I found out the word rapture is not even in the Bible. And it's a whole connotation that we've created that stirs up a fear that it manipulates us to say, if we don't follow Jesus in this certain way, you're going to be left behind and you don't want to be left behind. And you know what that means. And then we have this wonderful celebration of all Christians gathering together. Isn't it wonderful? We're going to heaven, but they're not. Mm, don't we love that? Uh-huh. And I'm like, ooh, that's Christianity? How does that work? 
that we're so rejoicing that we're going, you're not. We're going, you're not. Okay, but I'm going, you know, and I'm so happy I'm going. And we can't wait for everybody, Jesus, to come and take me and leave you, you know. And it was a kind of crazy uh, belief systems that we've created in our mind. This is why I want to say, what are you committed to? Let's be committed to those truths that work for us. Because then we find it so much easier to achieve the goal of that divine flow working within our lives. For this commitment gives us this wonderful permission for the divine flow to flow continually and consistently within our lives. When we say, I know God is good all the time, all the time God is good, that is not a cliche. That is a true spiritual truth embodied in a contemporary phrase. It is not meant to be taken flippantly, but to be lived out every day. It says, I believe this, and I'm committed to this. God is good all the time, and every day, rapture or not, world or not, death or hell or not, God is always good, and the goodness of God is there for me. And I'm going to allow that goodness to flow in a divine flow in me, through me. And not only am I receiving it, but I'm bestowing it. I'm giving it to you. And I'm sharing it to you because I'm committed to divine flow within my heart and life. I'm committed to this wonderful blessings. Because if you're willing to live this kind of commitment, then divine flow is yours. And the only way that you're going to enjoy life's journey is if you're committed to making the best of it and living it to the fullest. Now, that's the big question. God is saying, I'm offering all this to you. Do you want a good life? Do you want a full life? Do you want a blessed life? It's there for you. It's all there for you. No matter what you're going through, the blessings of God are there for you. This is the goodness of God. Even in, in sickness and in health, there is blessing in all realms, in all ways for us. Do you want it? It's there for you. If you're committed to making the best of this life, you'll have the best life. If you're committed to living the highest and best, you will be living every day the highest and best in our lives. So the question today is divine flow. You want it? It's yours. The cost is this, staying in the presence, that mind that is stayed on God, stayed on thee, as it says in Isaiah, and staying in that sense of that we're not allowing any distractions to carry us away, to remove us. Oh, one of the challenges you have in the, over the years, I've been the pastor here. This is going to be my 20th year this September. And I've seen so many people come and go, come in with a fire and a passion, find a new boyfriend, go on out the door with a fire and passion. Uh-huh. I've seen them come in with a fire and passion and then a job, take them out. Fire and passion, they're gone. I've seen them come in with fire and passion. Oh, I'm excited about all this, you know, great things that God's going to do and this is the church and good things are working in and through me and then something happens in their life and there's a distraction and they're taken away and we ask, where are they? What happened? I'm ever challenged by those clergy who will take the job as clergy and preach every Sunday, you need to be in church. And then Sunday, they're no longer employed and receiving a check. They're not in church. And I'm like, what? How can you do that? How can you say? Because it's the true essence of commitment within our lives. The depth of commitment within our lives. Because the richness of blessings and goodness are there as we are committed. And as we demonstrate that commitment, we open the doors for a consistent, a constant flow of the divine within our lives. For the more committed you are, the more you can experience flow to the deepest and purest levels, and it unleashes all of its power. Amen. Amen. So.